Can somebody give me a quick thumbs up on the chat that you can hear everything okay? Perfect. Cheers, Michael. So let me um, let me just get started with a sharing. So it looks like I'm gonna have to juggle my screens around slightly. <clears throat> Okay, so this um, this week is, I think we're on to about the fourth um, Integration Monday session now. And um, Nino was going to speak, but we had to do a little bit of a reschedule. So Nino's going to be speaking on the 6th of April, where he's going to talk about event hubs, which um, hopefully, well, so I've been chatting to him a little, little bit about it, and I think Nino's going to do a bit of a cheerleading session the week before the um, the talk summit in london and uh, hopefully that'll get everybody sort of g'd up for the the in-person event the next week so quick um note for anybody who hasn't um hasn't heard about the events so there's a little banner on the opening slide there about the biz talk summit and that's going to have a lot of content which is closely related to the integration sessions we've been doing on integration monday so if you like what you see here that that event if you can make it it's going to have more of the same kind of content with some of the speakers you'll be seeing Integration Monday as well, but the sessions shall be ones that you won't have seen before um, on Integration Monday, so that should be really cool. So um, this week I'm going to step in and I'm going to do the hybrid connectivity options session that I um, that I did in Seattle at the Integrate 2014 Summit. And um, actually, I've just got somebody talking about sound. Can everyone hear the the volumes all pretty good and everything? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so that must be a one-off. Um, what I'm going to do this this session is um, at the Integrate Summit we were time constrained, um, and I think that if I remember right, the session before me ran over by about three three quarters of the length of my session. So I had to chop everything down a bit. And what I'm going to do in this session is do the longer version. So I had to I had to chop a few things out. So we'll go into a little bit more detail about a couple of things, and um, and I've I've got a little demo that I'm going to slot in this week as well, and um, hopefully. hopefully you guys will enjoy what um, what I've got to say. So, I guess um, logistics wise, um, <clears throat> so Sri Ram's been putting out the um, the details on the um, on the chat about um, the, the link for questions and stuff like that. So hopefully that that will get everybody um, chatting on there, and I'll kind of keep an eye on that towards the end of the session. Um, the upcoming events for Integration Monday. So next week chatting with um, Josh at Microsoft. So next week we have Josh Twist, who's the product manager for API management. And there's recently been a new release of that with some quite good features in it. So if you're interested in API management, next week we've got Josh, who's going to tell us all about the, the new stuff. And um, he'd, he'd be there available for questions if anybody wants to sort of ask anything specific about that. And um, you can see the, the rest of the lineup for the following week. So we've got a few biz talk flavored events after that, particularly the healthcare ones are going to find quite interesting. Um, this session today then, so a little bit about me, most of you guys know who I am. Um, I've met a lot of people at various events and stuff, but for anybody who hasn't met me before, um, my name is Mike Stevenson. I'm based in the UK. I'm an integration and Azure architecture advisor. Um, so I work with a number of different companies, helping them work out how to, how to use the cloud, how to do integration properly. Um, I've been a Microsoft MVP for about seven or eight years now, and predominantly in the integration space, which is where my my sort of passion is. Um, the I'm also a Plural Site author, so if you like my stuff and you happen to be interested in RabbitMQ, you might find a course or two on the Plural Site library from me about how to use .NET with RabbitMQ. And I guess um, when I've when I've been around the world speaking to various people, one of the things that I find people are interested in is um, in the, the various blog content and stuff that I produce is um, I've been very lucky to work with a couple of customers who quite aggressively use the cloud and that means um, I've I think I've done like 33 now projects something like that where I've used um, Windows Azure or Microsoft Azure that have gone into production and another bunch of projects that have been non-production stuff like dev environments and stuff like that so 
I've used quite a number of different angles of usages here, which has given me quite a sort of interesting experience. And I think people are usually quite interested to hear about that real world type of stuff, which is why you'll see me talk about that quite a lot in my, my articles and papers and stuff. Um, I guess the other thing is some contact info for me there um, on the screen. So if anybody wants to reach out, hopefully I'll come across as quite an approachable guy. So if you've got any questions or you want to hook up on LinkedIn or something, people, please feel free to do that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So my tagline for the um, the Integrate Summit was, <laughs> thanks for uh, Sven there for putting my link for my Plural Site course on. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll I'll bung you some money later for that. <laughs> um, so my tagline for the Integrate Summit was Microsoft Integrations are about to level up. Are you ready? And the idea was that um, Azure is aggressively changing. There's new features all the time. There's some cool new ways of doing stuff. And the way we did something two years ago might be very different to the way we would do it today. And a lot of the companies that I've seen um, may use Azure in um, kind of in like a niche way. So they might do one, maybe two projects on it. They'll do specific use cases, but that broad adoption, I don't think is quite kicked off yet. So I guess there's like an economy of scale where we get to a certain point and just everyone uses it by default for everything. I don't think we've quite hit that point yet. And what I wanted to talk about in this session was really um, a few things. So I think customers could, um, <laughs> I see a lot of people beer judging by the chat there as well. So I'm going to try and not get distracted by that. Um, so the idea was in this session, I want to talk a little bit about some of the different features that are available on Azure to connect a cloud capability, whether it be infrastructure, platform, or whatever, to your on-premise data center. And by talking about these different options, I hope that it'll, you know, people will come away with um, with a couple of things. So number one. I'm hoping that people come away with an idea of how they might use Azure for something that they hadn't thought of before. Um, I'm hoping that people will come away feeling that I've shared some real world experience from proper projects rather than just hello world stuff. Um, I'm going to discuss a few of the integration challenges, which I think generally apply to cloud projects. And then I'm also going to cover these, these specific um, hybrid connectivity options. The agenda, really quickly, is I'm going to talk about the hybrid challenge, stakeholders, um, and how they come into play with, with these types of projects, then technology options and cover the, the specifics of each different way of doing it. And then I'm going to share some of my thoughts at the end. And I'll also, I think I'll talk a little bit about the, I tagged a little bit on at the Integrate Summit to talk about microservices and how hybrid and microservices might overlap and I'll, I'll leave that in and we'll we'll just cover that briefly at the end so hybrid challenge um last year when i was speaking at a few summits i used these two slides I'm about to show you to talk about how the organization or how the typical organization may look these days so if you think um, many organizations have um inside their enterprise will have network and data databases applications all the stuff that they've always had. But the modern enterprise also has a bunch of stuff that might be outside of the core um, physical organization, but are still part of what they part of what they do and what they offer. So we've for years we've had things like partners, that's not particularly new. But more recently things like SaaS applications, cloud platforms, devices and things are new things that the enterprises had to think about and had to be able to work with. And what I'd like to do is kind of change the way we look at that diagram and say, well, we've got these external things that our organization uses on the right, but the organization itself, um, in terms of integration and applications, we've usually got some integration, uh, some applications on premise, some applications on the cloud, and often we'll have an integration capability both on premise and in the cloud as well. And we we always in these type of diagrams we see the this kind of arrow that joins the two, you know, cloud and on premise things. And in this session today, what I'd like to talk about is this particular arrow kind of here say, look, right, it, on a diagram it's usually an arrow, but what is it? There's different things that can be in different scenarios. Um I guess, sorry, I'm picking up a little bit of little bit of chat there that this sounds not too great. Um is that kind of just started happening or
Okay, so I think we're getting the thumbs up. Right, so really just want to elaborate on what this line is and, and try and um, try and kind of get across this idea that when you look at it from a physical perspective, there's a number of different things it could be. Now, before we jump into that, I want to talk a little bit about stakeholders because the cloud projects that I've done, there's a number of different stakeholders that have usually come into play. And one of the most important things I've found is there's, there's kind of different agendas and different perspectives that you need to balance as an architect to make sure that we, we you know, can do our jobs effectively. Now, I'm hoping when we talk about these, you know, we'll just brush over quickly, but um, I'm hoping some of the people who've done cloud projects already will kind of recognize some of these things, and some of them are, are very um, integration specific as well. So if you imagine, um, We've got the IT senior manager, and he's kind of saying, well, look, I, I want us to go to the cloud, but often he, he thinks things like, well, you know, I want to put everything in the cloud because he thinks it's going to save him a load of money. He may have a perspective like, you know, commonly it'll be, I want a strategic solution, but I want to minimize complexity. I need to deliver for my customers. And all those kind of, kind of um, top-down sort of ideas are quite influential for what we'll end architect and as a solution but although the um the IT direct cio might be quite aggressive about cloud we then have the it administrator who in many organizations the cloud's been quite a new thing for these people to to understand and learn how to work with so quite often the some of the things i've come across um when talking to it admins is that they you know they're very comfortable with technologies like vpn but other technologies they're probably not familiar and that lack of familiarity means that often they're not confident about how they would work in production, how they'd support systems. And I'd often hear things like, well, we're concerned about the security, which is often one of the biggest biggest roadblocks for cloud adoption because people who may not actually have anything to physically back up the statement with, but it's, it's an easy way of going, I'm concerned about security, so let's just stop because we need to understand security better. And means is that we need to you know we, we don't really understand the solutions usually the real thing um often i'll hear things like well if will we get any trading on this new thing and if it's not servers how do they manage it so you know a lot of it admins managing this this thing platform as a service isn't something they're familiar with because they usually used to manage in virtual servers or physical servers we then get the support team. So an IT support team, I'd often come across similar challenges, which were things like, well, if it's in the cloud, if it's broken, how do we know? How do we fix it? You know, do we do we end up where we'll just get users complaining and we don't know where to look to find what the problem is? How can we monitor it? And also this this idea of do we get any training or not? Developers often have a very different perspective. So developers, as a, as a kind of big generalization, in my opinion, developers are much more open to new technologies usually so a developer would often say well I, I want to be able to play with new things and when there's a, a technical problem to solve a developer will often come up with a number of different ways that that he can do it and developers often just don't want to be blocked so they've, they've you know they may be in scrum teams or on a project where they've got committed deadlines and what they really want is the quickest way to solve the problem so that they can get on to the next thing and deliver their, their solution and often one of the challenges with developers is the, is the it works on my machine problem, but it doesn't really work when you go to production or it doesn't work for anybody else. And then we've got the, the prodigy who, you know, the most common thing is um, the project manager doesn't really care what the technical solution is. They just want to get it done and get their project finished. Now, if we think of the, the poor architect um, trying to manage all these stakeholders when he's designing the solution, or managing the enterprise architecture there's you know you've got all these different stakeholders with all of their different opinions and you can find that with the fact that there might be five six ten projects going on at the same time some of them will be doing completely different things and some of them will be doing things that are quite similar and then you combine that again with the fact that when it comes to choices of how do i you know what technical solution do i use to solve this problem um the, the architect's kind of stuck in the middle trying to figure out what, what's the best thing to do here, which technology do I pick that'll allow me to solve the problem, give me some strategic value, but also not have everybody just go and 
I don't get what we're doing here. So that, that's the difficulty of the of the architect. And what I'm going to try and do in this uh, in the rest of the demo is kind of just explain some of the different options and when you might use each one to try and make that architect's job easier. So um, the technology options. And so today I'm going to talk about um, seven, and I've got two two bits. So there's three of them that are word classes uh, networking technologies. So we're going to talk about express route, site to site VPN, point to site VPN. We're going to talk about some BizTalk stuff. So BizTalk hybrid connections and BizTalk adapter service, and some Azure service bus stuff around queues and relay. And I guess um, there might even be a few more that have come out since I first did this presentation, which was about two months ago. <laughs> uh, that, that's how quick um, the cloud changes. So I guess um, maybe there's maybe people have a few ideas of other things we could add to this deck. Now the way I'm going to tackle this is I'm going to do a quick lap around each um, each one, just at a really high level. Then I'm going to try and talk about some real projects where I've used each of these solutions. So everything I'm going to show you here is either a, a real project that I've, I've been involved in or it's a proof of concept that we did um, and, and kind of just show you how you would use the technology. So it's not going to be a deep dive, but it's just going to be a lap around the top of them. And we'll start with Express Route. Express Route is a way of adding Azure to your, um, to your WAN as part of an MPLS network. And the target scenarios for Express Route are really around moving lots of data between on-premise and the cloud, or connecting those two data centers at an infrastructure level to to get some really high performance. So the benefits of it are really things around latency and bandwidth, but there are a couple of constraints as well. So number one, it could be quite expensive, depending on how fast you want the, the network to be and how much data you want to be able to shove across the wire. And also you can have some uh, network provider constraints. So for example, in the UK, um, we were only able to use Express Route if you've got BT as your network provider, um, as of the time we, we did that project. But in other parts of the world, you might be able to use somebody like AT&T if you're in the States. So you really, the, the key thing with Express Route is you're kind of working at that really low level where you need to engage with your network provider to be able to set this up. And from a, from a sort of um, speed of delivery perspective, that can be quite a big deal because, you know, with some technologies you can get really quick um, turnaround times. You know, with with um, with this one, you're going to be talking a few weeks to a few months to be able to do anything, which I think is quite an important thing these days. Now, if we look at a, an example of how you might use this, so if you imagine we've globally distributed company where we've got data centers in the UK, Miami, and Denmark. And the idea that they are all connected on a big um, MPLS-based network, and effectively what we would do is connect Azure as another site on that network. If we look at a scenario of how we might use that, so one of them could be um, lift and shift of service. So if we imagine we have our on-premise data center, and we've got Active Directory, and we've got some various types of server in our data center, we could do is um, create a network in Azure, and we could connect that with Express Route, so it's part of our big WAN. And we might do something like create a synced read-only copy of Active Directory in Azure, so that we we would get some of the performance benefits of not having to go back to main Active Directory all the time. And then we could kind of just move some of these servers from the local data center into the cloud if they were a good choice of one to move. So. Examples of things you might move would be things like web servers would be really easy to move. Certain database servers might be easier than others. You can possibly move BizTalk, and sometimes that might be a bit more challenging depending on what your setup is. But the idea is that you just kind of create one big network where these things all work together. Another example of where I've used Express Route was um, where we wanted to do some um, data analysis on data from various parts of the world, and we kind of wanted to bring this data centrally. And th this particular project was more of a proof of concept to see how we would do um, business intelligence on the cloud. And what we wanted to do was spin up a SQL data warehouse in Azure, and we wanted to be able to feed data from these various 
data centers to this central SQL server. So with that, what we were able to do is join these to the MPLS network um, with Azure connected to it. And we could create a SQL server um, data warehouse, use SSIS to pull the data in and store it in this data warehouse. And then we were able to um, use things like Office 365 and Power BI to create some really rich reports on that data. But this idea of just pulling it centrally, that, that was quite a good way of um, taking advantage of the MPL network of express routes so that we can pull some quite big data over the wire. Okay, um, next, quest, uh, next section is point to site VPN. Sorry, I'm just going to check quickly just to make sure that hasn't missed a section. I thought there was the other one first. So point to VPN then. Um, Point of VPNs about how can I connect from my desktop to a, to a VM in Azure. And the target scenario for this is really around um, restrictions of access to an Azure VM over the RDP protocol. Now, sometimes you might work in a company where they, they may just allow you to use the RDP protocol to go to an external VM. And I've seen that in some companies, but in other companies, they have a lot tighter security restrictions. So one company I worked with where you physically couldn't RDP to anything outside of the local network. And with um, point of sight VPN, effectively this allows you to create a proxy on your network and download a VPN client, a bit like many consultancy type companies would be used to for accessing their local network. And um, so often, you know, you get a consultant goes on site, he'll connect his VPN software and be able to connect back to the office. Similar kind of thing for Azure. When you install this VPN client, effectively your RDP requests are tunneled over the SSTP protocol. And that makes them firewall and proxy server friendly because you're going over HTTPS. And it means that you'd be able to get to a VPN, which is normally not otherwise publicly accessible from that from that customer's network. The constraint is that your, v, uh, your VM in Azure would need to be part of a virtual network. But um, so if you, you've got like a standalone VM, you probably couldn't get to it. But if it's on a virtual network, you'd be able to. Now, if we look at a, an example of where we use this, so if you imagine we had an integration team working on many projects and they were globally distributed. So we had TFS online, for all of our source control and ALM stuff. And we had a, a development environment set up in Windows Azure with an active directory and a bunch of development servers and build servers. And our team made up of people who were based in Romania, people who were based in India, people in the UK and people in the US. And for the teams in, in India, Romania and the US, they were able to just get straight out to those dev machines without any problems. But in the UK, it wasn't as simple as that. So the guys were trying to connect and they, they basically just couldn't get out because the security of the local network and setup was, was preventing them from doing that. So we could get around this problem by using the VPN client. So we set a point of site VPN, we installed the VPN client on premise, and then the UK developers, if they wanted to go out to those VPNs, could just connect it up and access those VMs as if they were, they were local to where you are. So that was a really easy, low cost way to get around that challenge. The next, um, the next section is called site to site VPN. So site to site VPN is very similar to um, Express Route, and it's all about how do I connect my network on premise to my network in the cloud, and then one server can talk to another from that. Now, the key difference with site to site VPN and Express Route is because Express Roots is using the MPLS protocol, it's really a private connection between your data center and the and the Azure data center. And, and it was like I was saying before, how it's managed by a network provider. Whereas the VPN connectivity is different. So VPN would go over your public network connection. So you'd be connecting out over the internet, creating a VPN between the two data centers. So from a security perspective, VPN is less secure than Express Route. But the trade-off for that is um, VPN is much easier to set up, so you don't need to engage with a third-party network provider. Your um, your admins at your, your local data center should be able to set this up themselves. And it's all about, again, the same kinds of connectivity between servers on-prem 
servers in the cloud, but the um, the latency and bandwidth probably isn't going to be as good as you would get with ExpressRoute. There's a couple of constraints on this. So firstly, um, VPN is only going to work with a resource that's part of a virtual network in Azure. So one of the good things is that over time, there's more and more things getting the capability to add uh, to connect to a virtual network. So for example, more recently in Azure, a website can connect to a network. Um, I think the Josh will probably talk about this next week, but I was noticing that the uh, new release of API management seems to allow um, things like VPN and um, high and express route connectivity now, which I don't think were there previously. Um, and I guess um, you know, so site to site VPN is probably the one that your your IT pros are going to be most familiar with, and the one that they're most likely to point you towards, but it may not be the best approach for every solution. And if we take a look at um, an example of how we could use so if, again, we've got the on-premise data center, we've got a bunch of servers there, and we'll create um, a network in Azure and create the VPN between them. And then again, we can do that lift and shift pattern where we'll just move some servers up into the cloud. So next we have, um, I guess we've finished the finished the um, network technologies now. So now we're moving into the service bus ones. And first service bus um, service bus technology is called service bus relay. And this one's been around for quite a long time now. I think you know we're probably talking like four plus years that we've been able to use the service bus relay. And in my opinion, I really like it. I've used it quite a lot. It's a really easy, lightweight way to, to get stuff done really quickly. And Azure Service Bus Relay is a firewall-friendly bridge to expose a WCF or REST endpoint via the cloud. And a bit wordy, but I think the easiest way to, to kind of um, explain to somebody who might not be familiar with Relay what it is, is most of us are familiar with the idea of a some kind of hardware route that you might have on premise to sit and load balance across some WCF services. And if you imagine that we just took that hardware router and moved it up into the cloud, and then our services are still on prem and connected to the router, and that router is able to load balance public traffic coming through and pass that on to our on premise services. That's kind of a conceptual way of explaining that. And the key thing is that the, the two target scenarios are about this idea. WCF and REST services. The benefits of Service Bus Relay are that it's really simple to set up, and also it can be really low cost. But the the trade-offs are that you need to use the WCF Relay bindings, and also there's a limited management and monitoring story. Now, with um, with Relay, just to show an example of a project that I did that uh, that used it. So we had this thing we called hybrid integration in a day, and we've been doing some in the UK with Relay for quite a while and it had been going really well. And a partner company in Denmark needed to expose some services from WebSphere into um, into a, an application being developed in another data center. And normally they would have just connected this with a VPN, but that would have you know cost an amount of money to set up. Excuse me. Um, it would have required a bit of time for the infrastructure guys to get that all in place. And it would have, um, you know, by the time you've done that, a test environment and stuff it's quite a bit of work but with relay what we were able to do was um we kind of um set up azure service bus relay in the cloud and then we on premise we set up the wcf routing service and that meant we could connect these things up by the application calling out to the relay and that would route traffic to the wcf routing service where we could effectively forward traffic to any w uh, any web service Point exposed by WebSphere. And when we did this in Denmark, um, we basically went over there, spent the morning on a whiteboard just drawing through what we were going to do with the team. And by the end of the next day, we we had a fully working proof of concept, which was, was a pretty cool thing to, to kind of demonstrate. And just to show what that would look like, the, the messaging would go from the application, route through the relay on-prem, into the WebSphere system and back. Now, if you happen to have BizTalk, it can get even better because with BizTalk, um, you could read messages from the relay to BizTalk if, as if it was just the listening application, 
and then it could much much e uh, more easily hook into any of your line of business systems whereas WCF re uh, routing service has the limitation that it can only call another service now at this point what I was I've got a little bit of a demo that I thought um, people might be interested in seeing today just to just to really show the power of service bus relay in terms of um, speed of delivery um, so what I'm going to show you guys is um, there's a little demo that uh, me and my son worked on over the weekend so if you can see on the screen here you probably can notice that I've got Minecraft running and um, I was playing with playing around with my little boy the weekend with some computer stuff and uh, he was playing Minecraft and he kind of, he sort of showed me this um, little house he was building and the idea here is that um, in the house he wanted to put in treasure and kind of uh, make sure that nobody could get the treasure because they couldn't get through the door unless they knew the password so on the right of the door you'll notice there's a little computer screen and that's an add-on for Minecraft which is called um, computer craft and with that you're able to kind of write some code um, so that you can make it execute a program when somebody wants to open the door and the idea would be if um, if you want to get in you've got to put a username put a password in and um, and you know kind of once that's good you can get in if you put the wrong password in you can't get in so um, we played around with this idea for a little bit and then I sort of said and well look we you know what we could do that would be quite cool here would be um, why don't we rather than just write a little bit of hard coded stuff why don't we have a go at hooking this into Active Directory and see if you can if you can do this properly through the cloud so what we did uh, I'm just going to quickly show this to you so what we did was um, when you go up you click on the door and that will open up um, open up the application here and you've got to start a program called open door and before I put the password in what I'm going to quickly do is I'm going to show you my um, my virtual machine just so I can do the that I've not got anything up my sleeve so on my VM here I've got a um, WCF REST service running that's listening on the service bus relay and you can see here's my service bus endpoint and what this is going to do is in here when I send my request from Minecraft it's basically going to um, use this code here to check with Active Directory that I've supplied valid credentials and if it's good it's just going to return back a response that lets me know that I can go through the door so if I if I just pull that back up there and you can see that and let's nip back to Minecraft so we go in we click on the door sorry the wrong password in so you can see that's made a call out and it's granted me access so the door's now opened and I can go through the door it looks like I put a block in the way so I can go inside the building and you can see everything's quite good now if we go back to the VM you can see here that uh, the username was called Minecraft so you can see I've got a little bit of text saying Minecraft is allowed in and you can see that basically Minecraft called through well what, what I actually did was I put API management in front of service bus relay so I called through to API management through the relay on-prem this service executes against Active Directory and if it's good the, the door opens so let's have a quick look um, if we if we run that again so if I run So if I put a made up name in, the access is denied, sorry I can't come in. And if we go back over here, you can see the, the red text indicated somebody tried to get access but wasn't allowed. Now just to show you how easy that is, I can see here on the server side code, we're talking like you know, a couple of dozen lines of code. We've got some config to connect it to the relay. And then again on the Minecraft side, if we have a look, um, so if we look at that program, it's, you know, kind of the, the lines of text required to write the code to call from Minecraft. So we've got some details about the um, API management URL. We've 
and then as we sorry, I'm, just bear with me for a second. I seem to um, in Minecraft, I seem to be getting a lot of background noise. <laughs> right, so let's turn the weather off. I was getting a lot of sheep in the background <laughs> for some reason. So you can see here we've got um, we've got some text which basically strings together a JSON request, pops uh, some HTTP headers together, and then we do this HTTP post out to the API management, get the response back, and we just do a little bit of a little bit of validation of that response to see you know whether or not you're allowed in. And I've got a, if anyone's interested in that, I've got a post that talks about that in a bit more detail. Um, but that's just really to illustrate you know we. Me and a nine-year-old sat, um, took about a day to demo, and uh, it was a little bit of fun, you know. But hopefully, from a from a company perspective, the um, the whole idea is that you can do that kind of um, hybrid integration really quickly and really lightweight compared to what we're used to. So next technology, then we've now got um, Azure Service Bus Messaging and. Azure Service Bus Messaging is really different to all the other technologies we'll be talking about. So the most of the technologies have this idea that a, a source of a message opens a connection to a destination, sends a message, gets a response back, and then disconnects. And that's kind of a you know kind of a point-to-point -point, um, connection between source and destination. Azure Service Bus Messaging is different in that you're going to put a queue in the middle. So we've decoupled the sender and the receiver of a message, and that lets us do some messaging patterns that are different. So for example, we could do asynchronous messaging where we'll send a message and the receiver will get it sometime later. We have a durability capability. That means the um, the message can be saved and you know it, it's not going to go anywhere and it could be picked up anything from a couple of minutes to a couple of hours to a long time later. Um, we can do some fancy patterns like publish and subscribe. So the idea that I may send a message and it may be received by multiple people, and potentially they could dynamically add subscriptions to pick up messages. Um, with Service Bus Messaging, the key benefits are, number one, it's pretty simple. Two, it can be very low cost, and you can also do high volume. The constraints, I guess, whether it's a constraint or not, it's up for debate, but there's not a lot of protocols that you can talk to the um, service bus with. So AMQP is probably the main one that people should be using, which is all about message queuing. Um, you can also talk REST, and you can talk with the um, .NET um, API. Now, there's some helper libraries available for many of the technologies you might be using that kind of wrap these up. But I guess um, th these technologies are probably a little bit more difficult to use than something like HTTP, which most people would be more familiar with. Now, if we take a look at an example of where we've um, where we've used this this global API project, and the idea was that we had um, many different businesses which all had their own integration capabilities, and what we wanted to do was to create an API that could allow a consumer to talk to one API which would hook into any business, and from a company perspective that was really high value for us because it meant that the cost of partners integrating with us at a global scale was a lot less compared to the, the old way where they used to have to integrate with each business completely differently. So the challenge with that was, well, if we've got this API in the cloud and we've got, for argument's sake, say two data centers here, one for each business, and one of them's got BizTalk, one of them's got WebSphere, and we may add others later that had different technologies, how do we connect these all together? So with service bus messaging, what we're able to do is put the message queue in the cloud and then our local on-premise applications could be connected up to that service bus. And effectively, we've decoupled the API from the, the source applications that would, would kind of have the data in each business. And that meant we could have clients that could send messages through and the API could use service bus to route the message to the right business. And then on-prem, you know, if it was business one, BizTalk might do whatever it takes to populate a get customer message, which might involve SAP. And in, in business two, um, WebSphere might use both applications to get all the data to service um, a get customer message. And, but you could see that we, we kind of have this pub capability across countries, which was quite powerful. Another way you might use um, service bus messaging could be if we had, uh, 
for example, we wanted to publish some events. So if we had BizTalk, which was able to talk to a SQL Server database where an application had some interesting stuff happening, and BizTalk could pull out this data and kind of publish events to Service Bus. And that would mean that any application who was interested could come along and subscribe to these events, and they would just pull down the messages that they were interested in. So, for example, we might have had Dynamics getting updates about customers in certain groups, and we might have had business partners that were interested in messages about certain claims for insurance or something like that. The, the next technology then is called BizTalk Adapter Service, and this is the um, BizTalk Services kind of um, V1, V2 sort of capability on, on Azure, which we all know is going to be changing quite a bit. So I'll talk about what it is now, but I'd caveat that you might want to, if it's something you're interested in, you might want to keep an eye on it because there's probably going to be some changes in, maybe not necessarily the way it's implemented, but probably the way it's offered as a service on Azure. And this talk adapter service kind of conceptually combines the service bus relay, the BizTalk adapter pack, WCF adapters, and it offers a management experience to go with them that will allow you to connect in a great fashion through the cloud to many of the line of business applications that we're used to. So if you're familiar with BizTalk and that BizTalk adapter pack, you know that there's adapters for things like SAP, SQL Server, and Oracle. And really, the adapter service kind of allows you a way to, to reach through the cloud and use those adapters. And the experience, I guess, is fairly similar to using the, the adapter pack from BizTalk services. And the you know with, with these particular adapters, you can kind of use them from other applications as a WCF service. They're not really tied natively into BizTalk. Um, I guess the one constraint for this is you do need a BizTalk services subscription. And there's a, a cost associated with that to various degree, depending on how many adapters and how many connections and stuff like that. So I guess my um, my bit of advice there would be, if you think this is a good use case for you, you probably need to take a look at the cost and that would be involved. Uh, just a quick question there from um, viewer 487. So he's asking, is BizTalk adapter different from BizTalk uh, Windows Azure BizTalk services, so it's kind of the same thing. If you imagine the BizTalk adapter service is one of the one of the modules within Azure BizTalk services. But let's take a look at an example of how we might use this. So, we had um, a BizTalk services AI bridge in the the traditional BizTalk um, Mabs offering, and we had a mobile device that was going to call through to that bridge, but we wanted to reach down on premise and connect to SAP. The idea would be we'd um, set up the, Biz, the BizTalk adapter service um, endpoint, which would give us the management stuff that goes with it. And then um, install the on-premise agent, which would allow us to have the ability to use these adapter pack um, adapters to connect to various systems. So we'd configure that all up for SAP, and then the bridge would be able to use that cloud-based endpoint, which would forward and reach down into SAP on-premise. And then if we imagine that our mobile device sends a message and it reaches right down through into SAP, and then the mobile device would get its response back. So that's a pretty you know, pretty lightweight way of exposing SAP through to the cloud. Next one is BizTalk Hybrid Connections. So BizTalk Hybrid Connections, I think, is the newest out of them I'm talking about today. And I think um, there's a lot of similarities between um, BizTalk Hybrid Connections, Azure Service Bus, and BizTalk Adapter Services. So if you imagine um, BizTalk, uh, sorry, Azure Service Bus Relay sits in the middle, and it's really about WCF and REST services. And from a from a sort of abstraction perspective, if you imagine that we went up a level of abstraction to BizTalk Adapter Service, which was really about let's be more specialized and more specific and say, here's a way of using this hybrid connectivity bridge specifically for SAP and SQL. That makes it a bit easier for you guys to use it. So it's more specialized than Service Bus Relay, which would be any WCF service. Hybrid connections has really went the other way. So we're now at a lower abstraction level. And hybrid connections is really, 
it, it's kind of not specific to WCF. It's more about let's be able to do a relayed connection through on any port. So it could be port 80 if you're doing web services, port 443 if you're doing um, SSL, but it could equally be any other port you like as long as you've exposed it. And the idea here is, is talk hybrid connections. You can install an agent on premise and then you can create a port based connection through the cloud to an on premise service. And you can kind of access pretty much anything um, from an on-premise perspective, but in in um, Azure, you've got to be in a, one of the services that supports being able to call a hybrid connection. So that's kind of one of the constraints. And at the moment, you can only call it from an Azure website or Azure mobile services. So that means if you're doing any website development or API development, you could potentially use hybrid connections to reach down on-premise. I guess um, the key benefit is it's pretty simple to use but it gives you a slightly wider scope of usage than what Service Bus Relay would do. And again, like the um, adapter service, one of the key constraints is around the fact that you need this BizTalk Services subscription. So you probably need to have a little bit of a look at how many connections you might need, um, what kind of performance level you'd need, and, and what level of BizTalk Services subscription will be right for you. So that might mean, although it's quite simple, it might actually cost more than Service Bus Relay if you were doing it for a, um, for a you know kind of a non WCF scenario, so take a look at an example of how we might use this. So here I've got um, an on-premise center. I've got a an ASP.NET website, and that talks to an Oracle database. That that's our scenario. And imagine our users are used to calling through using that website that happens to use the Oracle backend. Earlier in the presentation, we talked about how our IT director might have this strategic sort of idea about let's get stuff in the cloud that we don't really need to have on-prem. So an IS web server could be a really good candidate to move to the cloud. And if we did that, we've now got our ASP.NET website hosted in an Azure website, which is great from a, a cost perspective, great from a scalability perspective. but We've got a bit of a challenge because we still need to talk to the Oracle database. So how do we do that? And what we would do is we'd set up the BizTalk services hybrid connection, which would give us an endpoint in the cloud, and we'd install the hybrid connection agent on premise. And when we um, when we do that, the agent on premise is then able to connect to any servers we allow it allow it to connect to. In the um, in the hybrid connection, we provide all of the details for the backend service we want to call. So in this case, we probably would give it a you know a name for the Oracle database server, a port, and some connection details would probably go in the hybrid connection config. And if you imagine that um, in the Azure website, we've got this ASP.NET app that's using ODP.NET, which is one of the Oracle data access components. Now, this is where the, the power of hybrid connections really comes because in the ASP.NET website, we're using ODP.NET. And imagine that we don't have to change a line of code and we can still go from the cloud to talk to that Oracle server. Now, what we would do is we'd go into the config file and basically change the connection string from the Oracle one. We just provide the hybrid connection endpoint um, connection string instead. And that means when we call um, in the code, when we access the, you know, the Oracle connection object and open it's going to use this hybrid connection um, connection string which is just magically going to open up the connection through the cloud to the on-premise database and um, and it, you know the, the whole thing is, sorry the whole thing is going to connect through like that without changing a single line of the code just that connection string and then basically our user could call the website and it would just flow straight through you know do whatever against the database and back out again as if the website was on premise. Okay, so that that was the um, the lap around the technologies, and now I just wanted to share some thinking around you know different aspects of this hybrid connectivity challenge, just to share my thoughts, and you know be good to get feedback from what people think, and we'll we'll have a look at the questions later. So, first thing is if you imagine in your company, you know I, I talked about how um, different different people you'll meet in an organization have different perspectives and um, you know and the key things kind of no two businesses will probably solve the, the problem the same way so 
have a think about this scenario here where we've got a BizTalk server in Azure and you want it to connect through to your on-premise um, WCF service that's in your data center. So how would your company do this? And to share some of my thoughts, well, I think there's only four options I could choose. The first one being I could do a site VPN. Second one would be Express Route. I could use um, Service Bus Relay or I could use Hybrid Connections. They would be my four choices. But if I if I sat with a bunch of you guys and we talked through the specifics of each business, you know, not everyone's going to pick the same choice, even though some might have one benefit versus another. So that's kind of the usual architecture problem where there isn't a right and wrong answer. It's much more what's right for you. And on the back of that, I think this whole idea about how to make an architect's decision is really important because sometimes it's very easy, but most often the answer really depends on a number of factors. And for making these kind of decisions, I like to have a framework for doing that. And many companies will work with some kind of you know architecture framework that they might have used for years. But in practice, what I've tended to find is that companies either, one, don't have a framework, or two, have a framework but don't really use it. When it comes to key decisions like this, I'm a big believer that even if you don't have a framework, you should use some logic-based decision to say, this is why we chose to do this particular approach, because it's just a good thing to do. And it means when somebody else comes and looks at it later, they understand the thinking behind why you connected it the way you did. And in sort of in absence of anything better, so if you haven't got a framework already, I'd recommend checking out the, the book on the screen here, because there's some pretty good um, guidance of advice and stuff around how you can use this kind of um, like a decision framework to support these kind of things. Um, and what we did is on the back of the advice in the book, we tend to follow a process where we look at the look at the requirements, produce some candidate architectures, but then we'd compare them and we'd rate those different choices to work out which one was the best. And then we'd decide which one to, to do. And uh, you know, quite a few companies do that, but the key bit is once you've made the decision, is to have somebody who's technically strong to own and lead the, the implementation of that decision and not just have architects who go, oh, we're going to pick this way of doing it, and then they, they wander off and leave the development team to get on with it, and then the dev team find it doesn't really work the way they thought it would. So that, that idea of architecture ownership, I think, is really important, um, especially when you're sort of adopting newer technologies. Now, when it comes to the decision you've got to make, um, in Britain, um, you have talked quite a bit about these four areas of, of things that, you know, factors that can influence your decision. And the four areas are design, delivery, operations, and organization. And I've just listed a few things on the screen here to kind of, you know, give you some, some of the thinking from the book, but they've got a big, you know, two, three page list of different, different things you should consider. And really it, it comes down to things like, can I deliver it? Does it fit well with other things that I'm and so it's pointless um, using a different approach in every single project. You want to try and get some reusability in there, which would be a good thing. But also this idea of training your teams, which was one of the concerns we had earlier. So if it's um, if your team's got no experience in one thing, but lots of experience in something else, that might influence the decision quite a bit. And then the fourth section, the organization one, I find is always the one that's really difficult to answer because it's all about, you know, what are the what are the benefits for the business and, and what are the long term and the you know the expense things and what what I find is quite interesting in different companies is um quite often the the architecture decision itself tends to get much more focused around can we deliver this by the end of the sprint or can we deliver this in two, three weeks time or whatever. And that you know that might be a sign that um you know you might choose a solution that we can just deliver but it might not be the best long term solution of I think going back to the original challenge of an architect of saying, how do I choose the right thing? This is really where the organization aspect comes in because you want to choose the right thing, not just for one project, but for your enterprise. And I think um, you know that, that's why the decision framework is quite important because you need to be able to stand there when, when you've got pressures from a project going, well, actually, you know, yeah, you might hit your sprint delivery at the end of the month, but we might then, you know, put ourselves in a position where we can't do with a project or something like that. And I, I guess my my key thing here is sort of think about the big picture if you're an architect. Um, 
the to go back to the decision earlier about when I said, look, here's a BizTalk server in the cloud, here's a WCF service on premise. Um, which way would you do it? So I was thinking a little bit about my my company that I was working with and kind of raided each of those areas to show you just a little bit about how we might do it. And the idea is we had four different options. We rate each one out of ten for each of the four categories, and then hopefully we'd come up with an obvious winner. And the idea here is that it isn't just always you know me who makes these decisions. The idea would be if we can get two or three people involved to have a look at um, an architecture decision and give the give that opinion, and hopefully that means we get a much more rounded view. Where sometimes it might be really obvious that everybody straight away gets it and thinks the same thing. Sometimes we might have a little bit of conflict where one person thinks one thing, somebody else thinks the other. But if you can come up with a consensus, that's usually a you know usually a sign of a good architecture decision. And after we'd rated them in a table, what we'd usually do is try and overlay them on this sort of radar type graph where you can just put the put the options on top of each other and you can kind of see which one's the, the most obvious. So I think in this case, um for us service bus relay would probably have been the most um the most appropriate choice because back then event, uh, express route was was kind of great from a design perspective but was brand new and wasn't really something we could rely on for delivery. Um, VPN was easy to set up, but um, you know we, we just kind of felt relay was the best all round for us, and at least that's something where you know six months later we can look at it and you've got some rationale behind why we um, why we picked the decision we did. So the next session, uh, the next section I wanted to talk about is from uh, from the great 2014, where it was this idea of right. So Microsoft um, rocked up at the summit. And kind of changed everything, and we all had um, we're all sitting chatting for a couple of days, going, well, what what does this mean for all the things that we're that we're doing? And what I wanted to do was kind of when my session was on the Friday, um, I kind of wanted to say, well, look, I've been thinking about this this week, this microservices idea. Here's a few thoughts on how it might have applied to a real project that I did that involved BizTalk, and then how hybrid might play into that as well. So if you imagine um, we've got this um, side of on-premise data center, cloud data center, and we've got our microservices in, in Azure, then you know we, we don't really know at this stage exactly what those microservices are going to be. So some of them are probably application-style services. Some of them might be integration ones. Some of them might be connectivity or something like that. And from a hybrid connectivity perspective, um, we, what we did know was that all all microservices are going to be um, connected to an Azure virtual network. So that means straight away, all of the networking technologies that I've talked about today are going to apply just as much as they, they do now. So we're in a, if you're using a networking technology, you're in a pretty safe place. Um, what we also know is that microservices are, um, you know, the native, well, they're, they're going to be able to talk to service bus relay and service bus queues. And we know that service bus is a, a very sort of mature and well-established part of the platform now. So I think anything I've told you today that was a technique involved in service bus, I think, again, is a pretty safe bet if you're in a microservices world. Now, a lot of, um, on some of the insider forums, a lot of us have been stressing back to Microsoft about the importance of microservices being able to communicate between each other with service bus as well. A lot of us feel that's a really important use case. So I think the service bus is a is, you know pretty safe bet. The ones I'm kind of a bit less sure about are the um the hybrid connections and BizTalk adapter service. So before I put this slide in and integrate, I had a bit of a chat with Guru just to make sure I wasn't saying anything um too contentious or out of line. But I think at the minute that they're in BizTalk services, they're there, they're supported. I think we know that um, hybrid connections has been talked about quite a bit as being one of the options for coming on-premise in the microservices world. So I would think um, hybrid connections are a pretty solid bet. Um, adapter service, we haven't really had a clear roadmap on, so so I would put a bit more of a question mark about that one. But I think what we, what we can probably say is that, um, you know, people use these things already, so they're definitely going to be there in one form or another and what I'd probably expect is that something like the branding might change on them or the 
the way you access them in Azure might change in terms of how in the portal. Um, they might be available as services in their own right, I think would be a good thing for hybrid, for example. And um, I think that the technology itself is probably fine. I just think I'd expect some changes in the way it gets packaged and given to us as customers. Um, so Guru, Guru's point at the time was just really to reinforce that if there is any changes, the migration story would be would be fairly seamless and that you know currently they're safe bets to bet on. Um, and I, I, as I say, I think most of the changes will be cosmetic and commercial rather than technology changes. Um, so if we if we talk more specifically about example of microservices versus hybrid versus biz talk ideas, so I thought a little bit about how. If I had a claims um, processing sort of um, integration scenario in BizTalk today, this might look a bit like um, you know messages come from a B2B partner into BizTalk, and I load SAP up with a bunch of messages. And I know um, there's a customer I've worked with who has a scenario like that. And what I wanted to think about was, well, if I had microservices available and hybrid available, how might I change the way that that um, solutions Mind in order to take advantage of some of the new things. So I think this this idea about being able to become more agile about integration and do stuff in lighter weight and changeable ways while still keeping the power of some of the old stuff, I think is quite a powerful thing. So with this um, this customer scenario we had today, it works really well, but there's a couple of problems with it. So number one, the process and logic for managing a cha uh, managing a claim coming in is all in business. So a lot of the decision making stuff, um, and because it's biz talk, it's just naturally that bit harder to change than it could be if it was somewhere else. But also we have, you know, th this solution's based off like a number of years ago, and we've got new channels for claims coming in now that didn't exist back then. So for example, mobile claims would be a new one, and with this particular solution, it's not that easy to just plug mobile claims into it as well. So what I wanted to think about was, well, if I microservices available and, and taking some fairly big assumptions of what it might be what what might this solution excuse me what might this solution look like in that world and what I came up with was this and I really just wanted to integrate throw this by say to the product team through my presentation is this the way that we should be thinking and the idea was well you know the thing that BizTalk does really well is it does integration into SAP and it does integration with um, part and it does batch based stuff and it does you know that that kind of flat file type scenario really well so what i thought was well if i can pull out the some of the logic from biz talk um around like the sort of validation of a claim the approval and put that into a microservices that was kind of like a, a sort of a business service type function and then stick an api in front of it that would mean that from a biz talk perspective i could simplify my solution by doing less work Biz talk and I've kind of outsourced some of that work into a microservice. And then the other benefit is it means that I can change the bit that changes most frequently. That microservice should be easier for me to change and easier for me to redirect to a new version of. So what it might look like would be um, something like a, you know a message comes in, Biz talk sends a bunch of messages up to the microservice after it's debatched, and then the microservice does its logic and shows the result on a service bus queue and that's pretty good for the first part of the process and then I thought well what about my mobile claims so maybe I've got um, either mobile devices or I've got new um, new partners who are more mature and more modern in their way of integration and they can call APIs instead of doing batch based stuff so maybe these guys would would call directly onto an API exposed from my microservice that I can you know being in this year I can probably like scale it out a lot easier than I would with biz talks so this whole idea of like you know getting it to thousands and thousands of people for mobile isn't really the same problem it would be otherwise and these guys might submit claims and they would just go through that microservice and again onto a service bus queue and then at the end processing from that queue I might have biz talks still getting a message transforming it to a sap message and doing that line of business integration that again biz talk does really well and the idea here is that by combining traditional plus microservices plus hybrid, 
I've been able to isolate the stuff that changes most frequently to let me be more agile about my integration platform. But I've kept BizTalk server for the things that it does really well that are difficult to do in the cloud. With a combination of Service Bus and BizTalk, I've been able to offer throttling for protection of SAP, but also protection of any of the on-prem systems from that, you know, those more challenged cloud-based consumers. And then I've also got the ability to scale to a really big scale on Azure if I need to, if I suddenly got a big burst of claims coming in. And you know, it's all about kind of reusing reusing that business logic that changes as well. So hopefully um at the time, I wanted to kind of just throw that as an idea of how integration um, solutions might evolve to encompass microservices in, services in what they already do, not just see microservices as a complete change of, you know, we do it this way or that way. We can maybe do it a bit of both. And I um, guess just to finish my presentation today was um, hopefully you guys um, quite liked it. I know there was a couple of bits where people said the sound was... Um, acting up a little so i hope it wasn't too bad but if you like the stuff that i've talked about today um on the screen here's a picture of a of a cloud-based integration platform that i built for a customer in hong kong a while back so i've got some um about nine or ten blog articles talking about this solution in different ways and some of the some of the biz talk and hybrid aspects to it so if you liked what you saw today you might like to read that article which i've um i've got the link on the screen for there and uh finally really just open it up for any questions that people might have and um, thanks everyone for bearing with me for what looks like just over an hour and um, I think the questions that we've got mainly on the, the website so I'm just going to drag that in um, see if there's any questions.